Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this week's episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lessons, you are looking at the doctrine that is found in the book of Psalms, chapters 49 through 86, and some of the chapters being removed, but essentially 49 through 86 in the book of Psalms is what we're looking at in this week's lessons. And as I do each week, I'm looking forward to sharing with you some things from the book of Psalms, this week's lessons, but also tying it into how it's relevant to us today. And I'd like to share with you some church history stories, as I always do, as it relates to the things that we're studying in our Come Follow Me lesson this week. And this week, I've actually caught a ton of church history stories, because there's one verse in, in the book of Psalms that really talks a lot about the Restoration. And whether the psalmist knew it or not, the words and the phrases, it's, oh man, this is, this is Book of Mormon stuff. And so I've got a lot of exciting church history stories that I'm I'm anxious to share with you. And then at the very end of the video, I've got a special announcement, something that I've been working on for a little while. And uh, so I'll, I'll get to that as well. But let's jump into the book of Psalms. I want to share with you uh, one of the verses that I found that kind of popped out at me uh, early on here in the reading. And I'd like to share with you just some, some things about it and how it relates perhaps to us in our lives. And this comes out of the chapter 63. Now in your Come Follow Me lesson, you will find a section heading that uh, says, The Lord will help me in my time of urgent need. And this verse, chapter 63, verse 1, is found in that particular section of the lesson. And the lesson, of, of course, I, I, it does an incredible job at it. And I'd like to just take a, a, kind of a different angle on this same, same verse. Um, it starts, uh, verse 1 here, in the 63rd chapter. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. And that's using a lot of imagery. It's the psalmist is saying is, is painting this picture of an individual being thirsty, and not just thirsty, but nearly dying of thirst, where his body is hurting and is because of the lack of water. The body wants this water so bad and is craving it so much that it's it's actually in pain and he's comparing that to the way that he is seeking god and it, i wonder if sometimes we we get to that point where we desperately want a relationship with the savior so bad that it nearly hurts us because of everything we're willing to give in order to have that relationship it makes me think of think of king limhi's father when he learns about the gospel and he says i will give up everything to know the Lord. And what a great lesson. The Savior is visiting with that rich man. And the rich man says, what do I, what do I need to come to know you? And the Savior says, give it all up and come follow me. And here the psalmist is saying, I want that relationship with, with the Savior as badly as my body needs water. Makes me think of this story. I don't think it's true, but, uh, but I remember hearing this a story about an individual who went to a very wise elderly person and says to this wise elderly person, I want to be as smart as you. Teach me everything you know. You're so wise. Everybody comes to you for understanding and knowledge. Teach me. I want to, I want to be smart like you. And so this wise individual says, okay, meet me at the beach tomorrow morning. And so this young man, he's all excited. He's, he's on his path to becoming a smart person. So he goes out to the beach the next morning and meets the old wise individual. And they start to walk into the water. And the young man's thinking, what in the world's going on here? And they keep walking into the water and they get about chest deep into the water. And the wise old individual suddenly grabs the young man by the back of the neck and throws his head under the water. And he holds him there. And the young man starts to struggle. The young man knows he's drowning, he's gonna die. So he's putting up a big fight and he can't get out of the water. Finally, the wise individual pulls his head out of the water and the man's gasping for air, you know, trying to recover from, from this physical ordeal. And the wise individual says, as soon as you want to learn as badly as you wanted to breathe, come and see me and then you'll be able to learn. Now that's pretty extreme when we're talking about coming to know the Savior and having a relationship with Him. And perhaps it's a bit of an extreme of the psalmist to compare us wanting to be with the Savior as badly as we want, as our body needs water. But the imagery there is real. 
and the the um, the imagery of the necessity for a relationship with the Savior is factual. That's that's gospel. And so the question might be, why? Why do we need? Why do we want to have, or should want to have, a relationship with the Savior? The Savior encourages it. He says, "Come unto me." In fact, that's one of the overriding themes of the Book of Mormon: is seek this Jesus, as Moroni says when he's concluding the Book of Mormon. Come unto Christ, find Him. Um, and now President Nelson in our day is telling us to do the same: hear Him. Well, how do we hear him? We got to come to him. We got to seek him. We got to go after him so that we can have that relationship with him so that he can talk to us. And then the question again, why? Why is it so important to have a relationship with the Savior? I think some of the answers to that question could be found in the great hymn that we all love, I Know My Redeemer Lives. So, in answer to that question, let me read some of the lyrics. I'm not going to read the whole song to you. But the question being, why do we need to have a relationship with the Savior? Why should we strive daily to have a relationship with Him? Here are some of the answers. I know my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives to bless me with His love. He lives to plead for me above. He lives to feed my hungry soul to feed. He lives to bless in time of need. He lives to grant me rich supply. He lives to guide me with His eye. He lives to comfort me when faint. He lives to hear my soul's complaint. He lives to silence all my fears. He lives to wipe away my tears. He lives to calm my troubled heart. He lives all blessings to impart. He lives my kind, wise, heavenly friend. He lives and loves me to the end. He lives and grants me daily breath. He lives and I shall conquer death. He lives my mansion to prepare. He lives to bring me safely there. He lives all glory to his name. He lives my Savior still the same. Those are some of the reasons why we should have a desire to have a relationship with our Savior. And not only why we should desire to have a relationship with him, but why we need to have a relationship with him and why it should be desirable to have that relationship with our Savior. And so I love the way the psalmist puts it. We should want that relationship with the Savior the same way our body needs and has to have water. Now I'll take you to one more verse. I've got a lot of church history stories to tell you. As I said, pictured behind me is the Hill Cumorah in upstate New York. It was this very hill where Moroni in the year 421 deposited the gold record. And it was this very hill beginning in 1823 where Joseph first saw the plates. He wouldn't extract them until years later. But in 1823, where Joseph saw the plates for the first time here at the hill. Um, the book of Psalms, chapter 85. And then let's get to some stories about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. How did it all happen? How did it go from this hill in 421 to a book where we can read it in any language, well, a lot of different languages throughout the world? Um, and not only did it come in book form, but now it's even in an app on our in our pockets. How did it go from here to being that convenient? I'm going to share some of those awesome stories with you. But first, to set it up, Psalms chapter 85, verse 11. And the psalmist says this, Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Can you just picture the psalmist seeing this hill and saying, Truth shall spring out of the of the earth. Moroni deposited the plates in the earth. Joseph Smith centuries or decades, yeah, centuries later would extract that record out of the earth. And what's the Book of Mormon? It's truth. Joseph Smith said that the, that the Book of Mormon is, um, uh, that, that there's no other, that there's no more true book than, than the Book of Mormon. Speaking, of course, of the doctrine that it contains. Um, he says, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon is the most correct book and an individual would get closer to God than by abiding by its precepts by any other way. That's the actual, pretty close to quote. But truth shall spring out of the earth, says the psalmist. And so I want to share with you about the truth springing forth out of the earth when it comes to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith 
and Moroni would meet here annually starting in 1823. But before I go through all those annual visitations, let's step back a little bit and let me take you back to the Smith family farm, the, the place where Joseph was living with his family. They were living in a small log cabin in the year 1823 when all this began. And Joseph was praying at his bedside in his upstairs bedroom. And so I'll take you over and show you that bedroom and pick up the story there. Now, this is a picture of the upstairs bedroom in the simple, humble Smith family log home. It's, this the home is not original. Um, it didn't survive the decades and many, many years of weather and lack of upkeep. Uh, and so when the church came out and wanted to restore the Smith family farm and make it available to people to come and visit, they, they knew that the cabin was here somewhere. Uh, and they looked at tax records to show where it might have been pretty close to. They started digging around and they found the original foundation stones. And then they reconstructed the home right on top of that original spot. So although this isn't the original woodwork and physical room that Joseph and his family lived in, um, it's, it's the space. This is where, this location is where the angel Moroni appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith. So the first vision happens in the spring of 1820. The Savior tells Joseph, be patient, further understanding will, will be coming. Well, it wasn't coming. He wasn't getting further instruction. And so he was worried that perhaps he had done something to offend God and lose his standing as prophet of the Restoration. And so in September of 1823, he was kneeling here and praying and, and seeking further, further instruction from the Lord when the angel Moroni appears. Now, when the angel Moroni appeared here, there were six themes that, angel, that the angel talked about with Joseph. There were six, six different things that went on in this conversation. First, Moroni called him by name. He knows who he is. He calls him by name. He then introduces himself. My name is Moroni. I am sent from the very presence of God. The third thing Moroni says is God has an important work for you to do, Joseph. And because of that work, your name is going to be had for good and evil throughout the world. In a nearby hill is deposited on gold plates a record of the, go of the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ as delivered by him to the ancient inhabitants of this continent. And then the fifth and sixth thing that, that Moroni talked about the rest of the night was quoting from the Bible scriptures about the temple and the second coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that a lot what we hear from President Nelson? about just about all that we hear from President Nelson, which is great. The Book of Mormon, the temple, and preparing for the second coming. That was the message that Moroni brought here to Joseph Smith. Well, Moroni comes and delivers that message. He leaves. Joseph is left there to ponder and think about what Moroni told him. Then Moroni appears again, tells him the exact same thing, plus a little bit more information. Then he leaves, leaving Joseph to think and ponder about what he's hearing. Moroni comes a third time, same thing, tells him all the same things again, plus a little bit more information. At the end of that third visit after Moroni leaves, Joseph says the rooster crows, it's time to get to work. He and his brothers head out into the field. He's a little tired because he's been up all night talking to an angel. And so his father notices that he's not working as, as hard as he usually does. And so Joseph Sr. figures that his son Joseph must be sick. He says, Joseph, why don't you go inside and lay down and rest? And so Joseph, he's heading back towards the house to do just that. He has to climb up and over a fence. When he does so, he's, his strength leaves him completely, and he falls on his face. He's laying face down in the dirt, and he hears his name, Joseph. Joseph. He rolls over, and he looks up, and it's the angel again. And the angel tells him, or asks the question, why didn't you tell your dad what happened last night? And Joseph admits, he says, I didn't think my dad would believe me. And the angel Moroni says, go back and tell your dad. He's going he's gonna to believe you. So he goes back and he says, Dad, I'm, it's not that I'm, I'm sick. It's just that I've been up all night. You see, I've been talking to this angel sent from the very presence of God. And God has an important work for me to do. So he rehearses to his dad all the things that Moroni had told him the night before. And Joseph Sr. listens patiently. And finally, when Joseph Jr. is done talking about what happened, his experience through the night, Joseph Sr. says, it is of God. Go and do as commanded. 
I believe that's the first testimony of this dispensation. Joseph Smith Sr. testifying to his son, the work that you're about is of God. There's a record in the hill. It's got to be true. So go and do as commanded. Now, what was Joseph Jr. commanded to do? He was commanded to go to the hill. He meets the angel Moroni there after a time. First, he gets there. He says, owing to the distinctness of the vision that I had had of the hill and where the plates were, I knew the spot the instant I arrived. And so he sees and describes this large stone that was sitting there on the ground. And the um, uh, dirt had piled up around it a little bit. So he scrapes the dirt away. And then he says he finds a, a lever. And this would have been like a big stick. He puts it underneath that rock. And like a lever, he, he pushes down on it. And the rock moves away a little bit. He gets down on his hands and knees and finishes off the job pushing the rock away. And he looks below where the rock was. And there is a box with the plates, just as he had seen in vision the night before. Well, he's not permitted to take the plates home. He needs to go through a preparatory period of time, which he does. So he uh, is instructed to meet with the angel Moroni every year on that same day annually until he is sufficiently prepared. So that year he doesn't get them. But what does he do? He goes home. He gathers up his family and he tells them of the experiences that he's had over the last 24 hours. Now here might be the most remarkable part of this whole story. His family believes him. I already told you how his dad believed him. But now he's got his siblings, his older brothers, his younger siblings, and his mom. And they all listen intently. And they believe the things that Joseph is saying. Now, why is that, I claim, the, one of the most incredible parts of this whole story? Because the people who knew him best, his siblings, his parents, trusted him and believed his testimony. They knew that what he, they, they knew Joseph so well that if he said something, it's got to be true. Because Joseph would never make up a story. Joseph would never lie. And so that's why I, I think that's so incredible that his siblings and his parents People who knew him best believed him immediately, right away. Now, for me, if I had had that experience and I came, or, or let's flip it around. Let's say my younger brother gathered up the family and said, hey, last night I didn't sleep because I was talking all night to an, an angel. And apparently God's got important work for me to do. And everybody in the entire world is going to know my name. How would I respond? Not the way Hiram and Alvin responded to Joseph. I would have been like, yeah, right. Are you kidding me? I was in the room. I was laying in the bed. I didn't see a light. I didn't hear a voice. You're crazy. But no, not for Joseph and his siblings. For those who knew him best, trusted him the most. So he goes back the next year. And he pushes back the rock. He looks in. There's the plates. He reaches in for the plates and he gets a shock. He reaches in a second time, gets a bigger shock. Joseph's kind of a tough guy. He goes in with all of his strength and might, reaches in to grab the plates, and he gets a shock so big that it throws him off his feet and onto his back. And he yells out, why can I not obtain the plates? And then the angel Moroni appears and says, it's because you have not been diligent in keeping the commandments of God. So you can't have them this year, Joseph. we got to try this again next year. Now Joseph, years later, would admit, that the commandment that he failed to keep that day was to bring forth the Book of Mormon for one purpose, and that was for the glory of God. He had let a thought enter his mind just for a split second that with these gold plates, he could solve his family's financial difficulties. No, Joseph, that's not the point. Come back. So Joseph goes away. He's working, as he always does, to help his family's financial situation. And he comes back again, and he pushes back the rock. There are the plates. He reaches in. No shock. Good so far. He pulls the plates out, sets them on the ground next to him. There's a couple of other artifacts in the, in the stone box, so he reaches in to pull those out. When he does, he turns to place them with the plates. The plates are gone. They've disappeared. He's panicking. He's looking under bushes behind trees. He's, he's probably really scared and really nervous right now. And we don't know how long the angel Moroni let him go through this panic, but eventually the Moroni appears. And I love to think of how this conversation could went. Uh, hey, Joseph, 
what's going on, man? <laughs> you're you look a little nervous. You got something to tell me? Joseph would have had to admit, confess to the angel Moroni that he pulled the plates out and they're gone. Well, Moroni had protected him. He saved him, of course. He had to teach Joseph a lesson. You see, there was another commandment. When you get the plates, you can't let them out of your sight. And what did Joseph do? Even for that split moment of setting him down and then turning back to the box. Even for the, just that moment, that was too long. And Joseph had to learn that hard lesson. So Joseph asked the question, will I ever be able to obtain the plates? And Moroni says, if you come back one year from now with the right person, you will be able to re obtain the plates. But if not, you'll be cut off and never obtain the plates. So Joseph leaves wondering, okay, well, who am I? I've always been commanded to come alone. And next year I've got to bring somebody with me. Now who am I going to bring with me? Well, Joseph doesn't know. But what does Joseph do for the next 364 days? Just what he did for the previous 365 days. Work. Just go and work. Earn some money to help support the family. So he gets a job offer by a man by the name of Josiah Stoll, who lives down in Colesville, New York. So he heads down about 140 miles south of Palmyra, <clears throat> and he's working for this man by the name of Josiah Stoll. And part of the employment agreement is that while he's working for Josiah, he will be able to room and board with a man by the name of Isaac Hale. Now, Josiah was living in Colesville, New York, right on the southern border of New York, just across the state line into Pennsylvania. It's a little town called Harmony, Pennsylvania, and that's where Isaac Hale lived. So he'd work all day in New York, across the state border, down into Harmony, and that's where he'd room and board with the Hale family. So while he was employed with Josiah and while he was living temporarily in Harmony, Pennsylvania, he was introduced and met um, Isaac Hell's daughter, Emma, Emma Hell. So this is how Joseph and Emma meet. Now Joseph and Emma, they fall in love with each other. Uh, time passes, they, they date each other. Um, Joseph eventually goes back to Palmyra, but he gets down to Harmony to see Emma as often as he can. And so the courtship went back and forth like this, both of them always having the intention of spending a lot of time together and eventually being married. Isaac Hale didn't like Joseph. He didn't like Joseph because of the stories that followed him. Isaac didn't believe in angels and gold Bibles and these sorts of things. And he started to notice a pattern that wherever Joseph went, trouble would follow him. The reason being is the adversary was trying to trip him up and just cause him turmoil in his life. And so that wasn't a lifestyle that Isaac had envisioned and dreamed for his daughter, Emma. And so he was against this marriage. And in fact, he was against the courtship. He says, no way, this isn't happening anymore. But Emma wanted to marry Joseph, and so they decided to elope. So they, they got married in South Cambridge by the Justice of the Peace, uh, no wedding party. Uh, after they eloped and they were legally married, they headed up north to Palmyra and moved immediately in with Joseph's pa parents, not only with his parents, but also his siblings. What a honeymoon for Emma that must have been. And so they're, they're living there at the Smith family farm, not in this house that's pictured here, uh, through the, the timeline of this story, they had moved from this home just down the road, still on the farm property, to a larger white home. And it was from that home, uh, late about midnight in September 1827, that Lucy Mack Smith, the prophet's mother, records in her journal that it was about midnight. And Joseph came down from the upstairs bedroom. He walked through the kitchen area, not saying anything to his mom, just heading out the front door. And she said she didn't think much of it. But then a few minutes later, Emma came down from the upstairs bedroom through the kitchen area where Mother Smith was sitting, didn't say anything to her mother-in-law, headed out the front door with Joseph. The two of them got into a horse-drawn wagon that was owned by um, Joseph Knight Sr., and they headed out into the night. And Lucy said, when I saw Emma, that's when I knew that they were going for the plates. You remember what Moroni tells Joseph, if you bring the right person, you can obtain the plates. They go down to the hill. They park the wagon at the base of the hill. Emma stays there. Joseph heads up the hill. He gets the plates. He has them in hand. He walks down the hill. And now he's a possessor of the plates. That would be translated into the Book of Mormon. Now Moroni says you got to bring the right person if, you want, if you're going to get the plates. Joseph had the plates. He had Emma at his side. So the obvious answer is Emma was the right person. Now there's no explanation as far as having been recorded by 
Moroni, Joseph, Emma, or Joseph's mother, as to why, what qualified Emma to be the right person. And I don't know what the reason would be either, other than her relationship with Joseph. Joseph now has the plates and Emma by his side. And together, as a couple, they would move forward in the work of the Lord. Now, I've looked at church callings that I've had, uh, various kinds. And, you know, no matter how much sacrifice I give towards serving in that calling, I reflect back and I realize now that my wife gave more of a sacrifice so that I could have the opportunity to serve in those callings. And I think it was like that with Joseph and Emma as well. Now, I'm confident in this video is not to focus on Emma, and so I'll just tell my opinion and provide facts in another video. But it's my opinion that Emma sacrificed more for the restoration of the church than anyone, perhaps even Joseph. Now, I know Joseph gave his life, but Emma gave so much. And not so much more. I'm not saying that what she gave was greater than the prophet's life. Don't mistake my words. But her sacrifice was great. So together, husband and wife, they're moving forward now in bringing forth the gospel of, or restoring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so they've got the plates. They're going to go through a series of uh, um, hiding places. The plate. Well, let me tell you a couple of them. So they get down to the base of the hill. Joseph needs to find a place to hide them. There's already rumors and talks going around that Joseph is going to be uncovering this buried treasure. And there's this old tree, this big tree that had fallen over. It had been dead long enough that it was all hollow on the inside. And so Joseph takes out a big knife and he goes over to the bark of this fallen tree and he cuts three sides of a square. So it makes a flap, opens the flap, drops the plates in there, closes the flap. The plates are safe and secure. Now, I did tell you in the story that Joseph couldn't let him out of his sight. That's true. But Joseph had to, that would be nearly impossible to do. Um, how does he go to the breakfast table and have breakfast with his family, you know, with the plates and can't show them to people? So in all practicality, he just had to have the plates safe and secure. When he was up on the hill and he just tossed them next to him and placed them next to him, that wasn't safe and secure. So he's got them safe and secure in this log. Joseph and Emma head home. Now, the family knows it's September. It's the anniversary. Emma goes with him. So they're all excited. Joseph, where are the plates? And what does Joseph say? Oh, they're hidden back at the base of the hill. Emma, did you see the plates? No, I didn't see the plates. So here again, the family has an opportunity to call Joseph out and say, man, we've been listening to these stories for years. You were supposed to go get the plates, and now you don't have the plates? Or at least you can't show them to us? But that's not how the conversation went. Joseph said, the plates are safe, the plates are secure. Can I show them to anybody? No, not even my wife. And what does the family do? Okay, that's all right with us, Joseph. We'll continue to move forward in faith because we trust you, because we know who you are. And so the plates were there. The time came that the plates, Joseph felt impressed that the plates weren't safe any longer. So it's time to go retrieve them, bring them a little closer to home. And so he goes out. At nighttime, again, those rumors are going around that Joseph's got this treasure and other people are coming after it. So he goes out, staying off the road, staying hidden. He gets the plates. He wraps them up. He puts them under his arm, kind of like carrying a football. And he starts coming back towards home. And he's he's taking the long route through the, through the forest off the road. But despite that, there's some people who, who found him, who knew where he was. So he's walking along, and an individual comes up and hits him. In the back and it surprises Joseph he falls to the falls to the ground he picks up the plates and he starts running with them now some scholars or experts or whatever you want to call them have estimated that the plates weighed about 50 pounds if you want to kind of estimate what 50 pounds is that's like going to Home Depot and picking up a bag of cement those come in 50 pound bags so this is a heavy thing and so now he's running with it and an assailant approaches him from the front and Joseph wrestles with the individual and gets him out of the way, and he keeps on moving. Wouldn't you like him as your star running back on a football team? So he keeps moving, and a third assailant approaches Joseph from the front, ready to tackle Joseph and bring him down. And Joseph winds up his fist and just lets it fly and hits this guy so hard 
that it dislocates Joseph's thumb. He keeps running. <clears throat> He's getting closer to the house, and he starts to yell out, Mother! 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 Lucy comes to the, to the bedroom window on the side of the house, the south side of the house. She lifts up the window. She's looking out, and it's dark, but there's the moon, and she can kind of make out that Joseph is running. Why is Joseph running? He must be in trouble. But what can Lucy do? Nothing. She stands there at the window waiting for Joseph to come. Joseph runs. He hands the plates to his mother. They're all wrapped up. She doesn't see him, but she takes him into her possession and brings him safely into the house. He collapses outside against the house, completely exhausted. Finally, he gets back into the house. He takes the plates, kind of secures them and hides them. And remember that thumb? He asks his dad to pop his thumb back into place because it was hurting so bad. Well, Joseph needed another place to hide the plates. His father, among many other things, was a cooper. A cooper is someone who builds barrels. And uh, Joseph Sr. was very good at it. He had a cooper shop out in the yard. And so Joseph took the plates out there to the cooper shop. He pries up a couple of floorboards of the shop. He pulls them up, puts the plates down on the, on the earth, puts those floorboards back over them, and then figures that they're safe. Goes back in the house. Well, not too much time would pass that Joseph would receive an impression that the plates are not safe. So he goes up, it goes out, finds those plates, and this time, instead of under the floorboards, he puts them up in the rafters up above where, where you'd have to really look up to see them. And he puts them there and he feels confident they're safe there. Not long after that, a mob comes looking for the plates and they think maybe they're in the cooper shop. So they go into the cooper shop, they take all the tools and the wood, they throw it out into the into the yard and they take their axe and they start opening up barrels and toolboxes and they start pounding on the floorboards thinking maybe the plates are under the floorboards but they weren't they were just above them just a few inches above their heads if they had looked up they would have found them but they didn't they were safe and protected joseph had the idea that he needed to move the plates again and so he takes the plates and this time he brings them into the house and he picks up some brick from the fireplace and he digs the hole and puts the plates in and lays the bricks back on top of the plates. And for a time, they stayed there underneath the fireplace of the, of the home. One time, a mob came into the house, and the plates were somewhat exposed. And so Joseph told his two sisters, get into the same bed, pretend like you're asleep. So they get in bed, they pretend like they're sleeping, and Joseph takes the plates and he slips them between the two girls. And the, the mob came in, they're looking in everywhere, and as, as evil and as horrible as these men were that were storming the house looking for the plates, they at least had the decency, or the common courtesy, I guess, to not disturb the two sleeping girls. And so the plates, again, were safe. Well, this continued to go on, and Joseph knew, I, this can't continue. I've got to get to work on translation, and the mobs are here. I'm constantly playing hide-and-seek with them. we got to get out of here. So where do they go? Well, they have nowhere to go. And they have no money to get there. Emma writes a letter to her father. It says, hey, we're in trouble up here. There's a lot of mobs, a lot of mean people that want to do us harm. And we need a place to, to go. Can we come and live with you for a little bit? Now, fortunately, Isaac Hell and Joseph Smith had one thing in common. And it was probably only one thing. And that was they both loved Emma. And so Isaac says, boy, if my little girl is in harm's way, of course you can come and stay with me. And if you have to bring Joseph with you, that's fine. And so Joseph did. Came with the plates and Emma. They moved down to Harmony, Pennsylvania. So let's leave New York and Joseph's log home here where the Moroni visits took place. And let me, let me show you the home that Joseph and Emma would live in while, they were tr while Joseph was translating the Book of Mormon. So Joseph and Emma lived with Emma's parents for a few months until Joseph and Isaac were able to negotiate the purchase of the, that Joseph would purchase from Isaac, the home and property adjacent to Isaac's home and property. And so Joseph and Emma, they left the hell home and they moved into this home here. Now, of course, this is not the original home. It's a reconstructed home of Joseph and Emma's. The original home actually burned down. And prior to it, it burning down, it was in the early 1900s, prior to it burning down, uh, somebody took a picture of it, and so we actually have a photograph of what it looked like. So it was reconstructed exactly the same way, and again, exactly in the same spot, because they found those original foundation stones. And so although this isn't the original lumber uh, that, that made up the Smith home, this is the spot 
where it all happened. And what did happen here? At this home, many things happened. Fifteen sections of the Doctrine and Covenants were received here. Uh, the Aaronic Priesthood was received under the hands of, of uh, uh, John the Baptist on the property here in Harmony. Not far from here, also in, in Pennsylvania, or, um, well, not far from here, um, uh, Peter, James, and John appeared and restored the Melchizedek Priesthood, ordaining um, Joseph and Oliver to that priesthood. But also here, 75% approximately of the Book of Mormon was translated. And Joseph moved in here with his wife, Emma. Emma acted as scribe for a time. Emma was pregnant. Emma was not feeling well through that pregnancy. And so the, and Joseph was so busy farming and trying to make a life for his family and trying to deal with his, his in-laws that hated his guts. And so life was a little difficult. It was busy. It was hectic. It was stressful. And so the work of translation was not really going on. Martin Harris, a friend of Joseph, comes from Palmyra to Harmony just to see how things are going, to see how the work is progressing. He finds out that the work is not progressing because of all these factors and other things. Uh, uh, Martin Harris offers his time to Joseph, saying, if you'll translate, I'll be your scribe. Joseph says, let's do it. So Joseph starts to, to translate. Martin Harris is acting as his scribe. This goes on for quite a while. They translate a lot of the Book of Mormon. Written out in Martin Harris's hand was 116 pages, transcripts, of the Book of Mormon translation. I won't get into the details of this story, but Martin Harris desperately wanted to take that work and show his wife back in Palmyra, 140 miles to the north. Joseph says, no. Martin says, please. Joseph says, well, ask the Lord. The Lord says, no. Martin says, come on, pretty please. Joseph asks the Lord again. The Lord says, hey, I've told you no, but you got to make your own choices here. You're going to be obedient or not. And Joseph, he goes to Martin and says, okay, you can, but you can only show it to this many people and you've got to bring them back by this day. Martin Harris says, no problem, I'll do it. Well, Martin Harris doesn't return on the appointed day. Joseph has to go to Palmyra, meet with Martin, and find out that the 116 pages had been lost. Just before Joseph went to Palmyra to discover that the 116 pages had been lost, Emma gave birth to that child. The child only lived a few hours before passing away. That child is buried very close to the Smith, Smith family home here in, in Harmony. Um, and so with all of this grief, Joseph has to return and tell Emma, we've lost 116 pages. And not only that, but the angel Moroni has taken back the Urim and Thummim and the plates. I've lost the ability to translate. And they're devastated. They're heartbroken. They're sick over it. And what does Emma say? Emma says to Joseph, you've been called by a prophet, or you've been called by God to be a prophet. You've seen an angel. You've been called to this work. You can do this again. And Joseph says, no, I can't. Really, Emma, it's all been taken. All is lost. And Emma says, no, Joseph, you can make this right. And it was with the encouragement of his wife that Joseph went through a repentance process and was able to qualify to reobtain the Urim and Thummim and the Book of Mormon. Martin Harris, as we look in the Doctrine and Covenants, sections 3 and 10, no, excuse me, sections 5 and 10, we find that Martin Harris went through his own very difficult repentance process, but was forgiven by the Lord eventually. But he was not allowed to sit a scribe any longer. So Joseph prays, Lord, I need a scribe. Please send one. Well, up in Palmyra, while all this was going on, another story was happening, and the two stories are going to collide. Hiram Smith is the superintendent of the school system there in Palmyra, and he needs a school teacher. He puts out an advertisement. A man comes, applies to be the teacher there in Palmyra. Hiram offers him the job. The man says, thank you for the job offer. It's a great job offer, but I'm going to turn it down. But you know who you should hire is my brother. Hiram says, I'd like to meet your brother then. So the brother comes to town and Hiram meets Oliver Cowdery. Hires Oliver Cowdery to be the school teacher. Now what was customary in those days is that the school teacher would room and board with the family of some of his students. He was teaching some of Joseph Smith's younger siblings. And so he, Oliver Cowdery moved in with the Smith family. 
Now, Oliver Cowdery heard about heard these rumors going around town about Joseph Smith and gold plates and angels and whatnot. So he came to the family, the Smith family, and said, hey, what are all these stories that I keep hearing about? And they wouldn't talk about it because they were tired of the mobs harassing him. And so they just kept it quiet. But Oliver Cowdery was persistent and kept after Father Smith in particular. Tell me these stories, what's going on? Finally, eventually, they gain, Oliver Cowdery gains the Smith family's trust. And he is um, told all the stories by Father Smith. Well, Oliver Cowdery says to Father Smith, I want to go meet your son to know if these things are true. Father Smith was very wise. He said, Oliver, you don't have to go to Harmony and meet my son to know if these things are true. You can pray and ask God and he'll tell you. So Oliver Cowdery did just that. He knelt down one day after school and he prayed to know if the stories that he's hearing about this restoration are true. He records in his journal that he was filled with the Spirit. He had no doubt that these things were true. And so he goes back to Father and Smith and he relates the experience. I now know by power of the Holy, by the power of the Holy Ghost that the work that your son is involved in is true. He says, I want to go to Harmony, not for my testimony's sake, but to assist in the work. So when the school year ended, Oliver Cowdery made his way down to Harmony, Pennsylvania. He arrives with Samuel Smith at his side, the younger brother of Joseph, on April 5th, April 5th, 1829. And uh, Samuel introduces Joseph and Oliver and Oliver to Joseph. And, um, and that's on April the 5th. On April the 6th, Joseph has some business that he needs to transact in town. So he takes care of that. Oliver Cowdery tagged along. On the 7th of April, they sit down for the first time and they start to translate the Book of Mormon, or Joseph starts to translate while Oliver acts, acts as a scribe. And from that day forward, they would give a full-time concentrated effort into translating the Book of Mormon. Now, when you look at April 7th until nearly the end of June of that same year, they translated the whole book. And you take how many days that is and you divide up 531 pages is what, is what makes up the entire Book of Mormon today. And you find that Joseph and Oliver are translating about eight pages of the Book of Mormon a day. They are flying through this translation and doing really well with it, of course. And how was the Book of Mormon translated? Joseph Smith never gave the details. Oliver Cowdery and Martin Harris um, told what they witnessed and what they experienced is how, how the details of how the translation worked or how it operated. And their testimony of it is, is fine and sufficient and maybe, maybe okay to include in a, in a different video. But for, for our focus here on the Book of Mormon and on Joseph, I'll tell you what Joseph said about the translation of the Book of Mormon. One day, years later, he was in Kirtland, Ohio, and he was in a meeting with uh, the First Presidency of the Church and the Three Witnesses of the Book of Mormon and the Eight Witnesses of the Book of Mormon. And that's it. So he's in this small conference, this small room with a, a small group of, of people. And being those people, the First Presidency the, and all the witnesses and no one else, if Joseph was ever to divulge how the Book of Mormon was translated, the details of it, the process, it would have been in that group. Hiram Smith, sensing this perhaps, he asks his brother, Joseph, tell us a little bit about the translation process of the Book of Mormon. And Joseph Smith, as recorded in the history of the church, this would have been the time to reveal how it happened to, the, to this particular group. Joseph Smith simply replied to his brother, Brother Hiram, there are some things that the world should just not know. And that was it, as far as the explanation. Joseph then testified to the group that the Book of Mormon came forth by the gift and power of God. And that was sufficient for Joseph. That was sufficient for him to in, in his explanation. And I've often wondered, particularly with this group, why wouldn't Joseph have said, this is how it happened. And the conclusion that I've come up with is that the only way Joseph could have described the process is to put him at the center of the story himself. Well, I looked in the Urim and Thummim. 
I saw this, I heard this, I did this. And so now it's all about Joseph. But Joseph understood, having gone through the process, that he had nothing to do with it, that it came forth by the gift and power of God. And so that's where he placed the focus, and that's where he, he uh, that, was, that was the only explanation he gave, because that was all, the only explanation that could be given. I told you about 75% of the Book of Mormon was translated here. Joseph and Oliver and now Emma are starting to suffer persecution again. This time the persecution is instigated by a man by the name of Nathaniel Lewis, who is the uncle of Emma. So it's not just some weird, strange mobs that are coming after Joseph. It's Emma's family that's coming after Joseph and harassing him. Now it's personal. They can't stay. They've got to get out of town in order to finish the work. Oliver Cowdery, when he was acting, not acting, when he actually was the school teacher in Palmyra, uh, came in contact and became friends through some association, we're not quite sure, but be, befriended a man by the name of, of uh, David Whitmer. David Whitmer lived in Fayette, New York, about 30 miles south of Palmyra. And David would go into Palmyra frequently to transact business. Now, somehow, in some way, their paths crossed each other. They started talking about the rulers in Palmyra. Oliver says, David, I'm going to go down to Harmony and check this stuff out for myself. David says, when you're there, write me a letter and tell me what you find out. So while Oliver is down in uh, Harmony working on the translation with Joseph, he's writing letters to David Whitmer. The work I'm involved in is true. It's it, everything we thought it might be. It actually is. And he would share his testimony through these letters. David would share those letters with the other members of his family. So Oliver Cowdery says, Joseph, we got to get out of town. I think I have a place we can go. He writes a letter to David Whitmer and says, we need a place to finish the work. Can we come to your home? Well, it wasn't David's home. It was his parents. So he goes to his parents and says, Oliver and Joseph are in trouble. Can they come here? And how do the Whitmers respond? Yes, they can come here. They knew that they were being chased by the mobs. That the mobs would probably come to Fayette. They had never met the prophet Joseph. They had never read the Book of Mormon. They hadn't seen the plates or anything like that. They never went to sacrament meeting or testimony meeting because none of those things existed. They hadn't met with the missionaries because those wouldn't be called for another year or so. So why did they let him come? Because the letters from Oliver Cowdery testified of the truth. And the Whitmer family knew that the work was true because of the testimony of Oliver. And so although they hadn't met the prophet, although they hadn't read the Book of Mormon, they knew that the work was true because they had felt that reassurance by way of the Spirit. So they said, yes, come on up here. So they did. Joseph and Oliver would head up. Emma would follow a few weeks later. And now we've got the three of them there at the Whitmer farm. The other 25% of the Book of Mormon would be translated. It was here on the Whitmer farm that the three witnesses had their experiences, the experience of where they became witnesses of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is translated. It's now time to find a printer. Joseph and Oliver head into Rochester where the big printers are and uh, they started talking and trying to negotiate a deal and the printer said no we don't want anything to do with that angel stuff with your religion it's just gonna bring bad stuff to us so no. So Joseph goes to his hometown Palmyra. There's a printer there in Palmyra by the name of E.B. Grandin. Goes to the Grandin and says hey I've got this transcript. I'd like to print it. 5,000 copies. It's a big book. It's going to be a big deal for, for you business-wise. And Grandin says, no, I'm not going to get associated with all this religion and, and um, angel and gold Bible and stuff like that. So Joseph doesn't know what to do. Grandin's business associates come to him and say, hey, look, it's a business deal. This is a great business deal for you. You're not, you're not, you know, you don't have to claim that you believe where the book came from. You're just, this is just a business opportunity. So Grandin goes back to Joseph and says, hey, you know what? This is a good business opportunity for me. Let's do it. So right there in Joseph's hometown was a printer that could print the Book of Mormon. 5,000 copies was the initial run. Joseph would stay down in Fayette 
and give the manuscript to Oliver and Hiram Smith, and the two of them would oversee the work of translation at the Grandin Building. So let me leave Harmony, and just for a brief few minutes as we wrap up this video, I'll show you the, uh, a picture of the interior of the Grandin Building where the Book of Mormon was printed. The Grandin Building in Palmyra, New York is very unique. Unique in style and architecture, but it's unique in that it's original. This room is where the Book of Mormon was published. It's not a reconstructed room. This is the actual room where it happened. The Book of Mormon would be completed and ready for, for sale or for distribution on March 26, 1830. Just a few weeks later, April 6, 1830, the church back at the Whitmer Farm would be officially organized. I'd like to share with you a testimony of the Book of Mormon by Elder Holland. He's speaking about Joseph and Hiram at Carthage Jail. They're, they're nearing the end of their life. The mob is surrounding the, uh, the jail, and, and, and they've only got a moment to live. That's the setting in which Elder Holland has described, and then he shares this. As one of a thousand elements of my own testimony of the divinity of the Book of Mormon, I submit this as yet one more evidence of its truthfulness. In this, their greatest and last hour of need, referring to Joseph and, Joseph and Hiram in Carthage. In this, their greatest and last hour of need, I ask you, would these men blaspheme before God by continuing to fix their lives, their honor, and their own search for eternal salvation on a book, and by implication a church and a ministry they had fictitiously created out of whole cloth? Never mind that their wives are about to be widows and their children fatherless. Never mind that their little band of followers will yet be houseless, friendless, and homeless, and that their children will leave footprints of blood across frozen rivers and an untamed prairie floor. Never mind that legions will die and other legions live, declaring in the four quarters of this earth that they know the Book of Mormon and the church which espouses it to be true. Disregard all that and tell me whether in this hour of death these two men would enter the presence of their eternal judge, quoting from and finding solace in a book, which, if not the very word of God, would brand them as impostors and charlatans until the end of time. They would not do that. They, would willing, they, were willing, they were willing to die rather than deny the divine origin and the eternal truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. My testimony is the same, that the Book of Mormon is true. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Pettit. For the last several years, I have been leading church history tours. I've taken thousands of people to the sacred sites of the Restoration, where I've been able to tell them on site, at, on location, the stories that occurred there and read some of the doctrine that was revealed at these sacred places. I've decided now to take that tour virtually, to provide a virtual church history tour. The reason being is there's so few people that can actually attend an in-person, live church history tour because they're really expensive. They take 10 days of your time you're sleeping in the hotels, you're eating food on the go, you're on a bus for 2,000 miles. It's, it's hard to do for a lot of people. And so making the tour virtual will allow more people to experience these wonderful sacred sites. But I'm gonna treat these virtual church history tours exactly the same as I do the live in-person tours. We're gonna to go to all the sites in chronological order. I'm not gonna be sitting in my office with a picture behind me. We're going to be actually on site. It's going to be as if you and I are walking through these sites together. I'm telling you the stories. We're reading out of the Doctrine and Covenants together. I will share every single story on the virtual church history tour that I do on the in-person tour. But I'm actually going to have more time to share more stories. So the virtual tour is going to have more content than the in-person live tour does. How does it work? Chronologically, we're going to start at Joseph Smith's birthplace in Sharon, Vermont. We're going to follow him chronologically all the way through the history of the church. But we're not just going to finish with Joseph at Carthage Jail, which we're going to go there virtually together. But we're going to extend and keep going west as I share a lot of pioneer stories 
from the sites in Wyoming and Nebraska where it actually happened. And so come with me virtually to Kirtland and Nauvoo and Liberty Gel and the Susquehanna River and so much more. And I'll be able to share the stories with you and the doctrine from the sites where they actually took place. Now, of course, this is going to come at, at an expense to me. And so there, there is a cost for these virtual church history tours. On October 1st, I'm going to have them all done. There's going to be a total of 11 video links, each video link being about two hours long. So the content is going to be somewhere between 20 and 25 hours. Again, it's all on location, right from the place that it actually happened. And I'm going to be able to take you to places that I can't take large groups. Places like Hans Mill and uh, sites around Adam on Diamond and, and um, kind of the behind the scenes and some other unique church history sites as well. So October 1st is when they come out. The cost between now and October 1st is discounted. It's $40. $40 for the 11 videos for the 25 hours of content. After October 1st, it's going to go up to $50. So you can save 20% by registering early, kind of a pre-sale deal. If you're interested in it, there is a link below this video that you can click and you can send my you you can send me your information and uh, so you'll be ready to go come October 1st. Uh, or if, if the link isn't working or you can't find it below this video or whatever, then you can go to my blog and go to tomcpettit.com slash virtual tours, virtual tours being one word. Um, and so I look forward to being with you virtually at the sacred historical sites of the church.